Our hymn of decision, following the message today, 376, 376, if you want to turn to that and have it read. I've had the opportunity, as probably some of you have, or many of you have, to do a lot of traveling. Anybody here done what they considered a lot of traveling? Anybody? Get around and get to see a lot of different things, go a lot to, to a lot of different places. And everywhere I go, and we talk about, you know, I'm from so, you know, northeast Ohio or wherever I tell folks, and I'm real far away from home. They, uh, and, and I'm looking for somewhere, you know, from where I'm at, they give me directions to where, you know, I need to go. And then I meet somebody else a little further down, and I visit with them a little bit, and I tell them where I'm from and where I want to go, and they give me directions, <laughs> you know, on how to get to where I want to go. And depending on how many people I meet along the way, it's interesting how many different directions I can get <laughs> to the place that I want to go. It, it never fails. There are those people that you meet along the way that, that they know how to get, you know, to where you want to go. There's a, a, a funny little story about it. A city boy that was driving down a country road and came across a farmer and he stopped and he asked the farmer, he says, you know, I'm looking for, you know, a granary by the name of such and such. And, and he says, oh yeah, I know the place. What you want to do is you want to go down to the Red Barn, turn right, go down four miles past the, uh, the green farmhouse. You make a left, then you go down across, well wait a minute. You go down to that Red Barn and you make a left and then you go down two miles you cross a little bridge. No, wait a minute. You back up for two miles, and then you, you cross west over. You'll see a... No, wait a minute. Come to think of it, you can't get there from here. Okay, it's a dumb joke, but... <laughs> There's always those, though, that, that seem to know, you know, and, and everybody has a different idea of how something you know, how you can get a different way to go, so to speak, to get to where you want to. There are a lot of people in the world who think there are many different ways to God. You know, Jesus, when he came into the, the world and he began to talk to the Jewish leaders and began to reveal to them who the Father in heaven was, they said, no, 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 that's not the way. We have been teaching the way. And they've been trying to tell Jesus exactly the manner in which things should be done. Now imagine if somebody came into your house, moved into your house. They're not part of the family, but they moved into your house. And maybe by invitation, maybe not. <laughs> and they just made their way in and they decided to look around your home and see the way that you've arranged and you've done things. And they began to say, now wait a minute here, you know, you really shouldn't put the TV on that wall. The TV should really go over here. You know, and your, your easy chair that you're comfortable in, that shouldn't go there. It just doesn't look right. Let's put that out on the porch. Can you imagine somebody moving your chair today? <laughs> somebody coming into your house that, that isn't part of the family, isn't pretty to, to, isn't involved in what's going on, has no invested interest into it. They're unwilling to even become part of the family, but they certainly have their way of telling you the way things ought to be done. Wouldn't that drive me nuts? That certainly would drive me nuts. And here Jesus is, and he comes into the world, and he says to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And there are many that are saying, uh-uh, no, we don't need you, Jesus, to get to God. There are many in this world today who say they don't need Jesus in order to be saved, in order to have salvation. You know, even the early church was taught by Peter in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, in talking about Jesus to the Jewish leaders, these same people that crucified Christ. These same ones, he said, neither is there salvation in any other name. Speaking of who? Jesus Christ. Salvation comes through him. Now, there may be many roads in this world to Jesus. Your life may lead you to Jesus in different ways. Maybe your bottom is here and somebody else's bottom is here. And they got to go all that way to bounce back, to recognize Jesus. There may be 
admittedly many ways to Jesus. You may learn by going, you know, learning about Jesus through, you know, somebody that comes from a foreign land as a missionary. You may learn by uh, someone who uh, has failed in their own life and scratched up and learned about Jesus and brings that message to you. You may learn from it about your parents. You may learn about Jesus from reading the scripture. You may learn about Jesus from a particular sermon or preachers or a combination of things. There may be many roads in this world in which God helps you to find Jesus, but there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus. And that's very important, and that's what Jesus was trying to tell him. He says, I am the way. I am the way. This word way has to do with path. It has to do with the road that leads to you see, the road you take will determine your destination. Think about that for a minute. The road you take will determine your destination. When you decide to do, let's say you decide to follow after the example of your fellow employees who decide to... <laughs> Did I ever tell you about when I was working at that campus? One of my jobs in taking care of the campus work and work study was to care for the, uh, the cemeteries. And one day we were out there and we were weed eating and mowing and everything. And it was lunchtime, so we took our little break and we had our lunch. And, and we're sitting there. And it was time for break to be over. And when it was time, I looked at my watch and said, okay, let's get back to work. And you know what one of the other fellows said? Eh, I might go back to work. Nobody's watching. <laughs> let's just relax a little longer. You know, we've got plenty of time to do what we need to do. We, don't, we can take an extra long break. Now, it would have been very easy to say, you know, it is hot out. <laughs> and yeah, we could probably get all the work done in the allotted time if we took an extra 15 minutes. We still have time to get the work done. I could have gone through my mind and, and said a number of different things to myself to justify. But, you know, when you stop to think about it, there is only, you know, when you're given a job in a certain amount of time, when it comes down to it, to be honest, there's not a lot of ways to be honest. Honesty is honesty. <laughs> right is right. And when time's up, time's up. You know, and someday in this world, our time will be up. <laughs> and we're not going to be able to extend it. So there's a way of doing things. If I were to choose to do certain things in a dishonest way, where does that dishonest way lead me? I mean, think about it. Remember Jesus said, if you are faithful with the little things, then what happens? You get to have bigger things. But if you're unfaithful with the little things, even those little things will be taken away from you. The path you choose in life will determine the, the, the destination in which you end up. Now, the Israelites should have known this. Because back in Isaiah, notice what the scripture said. The desert and the parched land will be glad. Really? Jesus is going to give them a picture, a metaphor. See, there's a place in which nothing's going on. It's, it's, a, it's a dry place. It's an empty place. Now God says that this empty place, this desert, this parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those who have fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will... The lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where the jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. See, what he's saying here to a people, Israel at the time that Isaiah is talking to them, they're going through a very terrible time because they rejected God. They chose a way that wasn't going to be for their good. And they were looking forward to captivity, being taken away from their homeland and having their homes destroyed and their families killed. 
And this is what they were looking forward to. And so Isaiah said, the time will come in which, you know, even though you feel empty now, God is going to bring about his will. And he goes on to say this, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. So Isaiah is prophesying to the people of Israel who now were the recipients or as Jesus was talking to the people in which this message was coming true. Imagine living in that day. You read all your life these prophecies that someday, and, and the, your, your people have been waiting for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years for these prophecies to be fulfilled. And now you're standing next to Jesus and he is the fulfillment. And you just got done reading. I remember when Jesus was at Nazareth in his own hometown one time. Yeah, I, this ver these come back to me um, when I was thinking about moving back here. Jesus went back to Nazareth one time and he's reading from Isaiah. And he said, they, you know, he's reading from chapter 53 here. It says, and they led the sheep, you know, led him like a sheep to the slaughter. You know, and then he puts the scroll down in Isaiah and he says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. So here his hometown gets the opportunity to see the Messiah, the fulfillment of scripture. And they have one of the first opportunities to welcome the Messiah and to recognize God's great plan. And they try to kill him. In fulfillment of the other prophecy that says a prophet is not received even in his own home town. Now I'm not a prophet, but I always had you know a little fear back in the back that when I go to preach in my own home church, am I going to get <laughs> going to throw me off a cliff? <laughs> but here Jesus is the fulfillment in his own hometown, and here he is, the way, this highway, the real highway to heaven. Presented before the people. I am the way to the Father. And what does this even his disciples say? Well, we don't know the way. Show us the way. And there's people in this world who you are going to be meeting if you haven't met them already, and I'm sure many of you have. People are dying to know the way to the Father. How are you, how are they going to get there? Now, now you may say to yourself, um, you know, as long as I as long as I am honest and I do, you know, things as best I can, and people say, okay, he goes to church, he calls himself a Christian, so he's a Christian, he does good things, that somehow they're going to translate that into saying, I want to be like that, and in wanting to be like that, I am going to end up in heaven. But there's something in that equation that's missing. Because living the kind of life and the example where people look at you and say, you know what, he's a Christian, he lives consistently as best he can, which is a good report, I mean, none of us are perfect, right? <laughs> but now we have an opportunity, so they, from their areas, they come to you, what are they going to find when they get there? Just a good life? Because there's a lot of people who can live a good life and be nice people, right? Without God. Haven't you met people like that? They give to the poor. They take care of their family. You know, they don't cheat or swindle anybody. They haven't murdered anybody. You know. <laughs> but they don't know God. And they're good humans. But is... Then what? You see, many of the paths of the people in life might come to you, but at, at that point, where do you lead them? Do you lead them to the gate of heaven, to Jesus himself? That's the question. Jesus said, I am the way. You're not the way. They're not going to come to you and because you're a wonderful person, get to heaven. They're going to come to you and you're going to tell them about the way. You see. That's the link in the chain that will cause a, the God's church to grow or will kill it. You ever think about it? You ever go out to tow something and you throw the chain on it? 
and the link popped. You ever had a chain break on? I have. Can't tow anything, can you, when there's a link missing? <laughs> It's the same with God's church. If that link is not made between all the goodness that we can possess and the opening of people's lives, if we don't connect that with Jesus, then they'll never be pulled out of their sin. And Jesus said, I am the way. And Isaiah prophesied about it. Uh, that there will be this highway, the highway of holiness. It will be for those who will walk in that way. It is important to take and follow the directions that are given. Just knowing them never got anyone anywhere. Look at some of the benefits. This is the beauty of it. God says if you're going to walk on the way, there are a number of things that are going to come from it. And that is found in Jeremiah chapter 31. At that time, speaking of um, the time where God brings all of these things about through the Messiah, he says, at that time, I will be the God of all the families in Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness. And I'm going to just kind of underline a few of them here of these benefits. He, God says, I'm going to come and give rest to Israel. Now, he's not talking about the physical lineage of, um, of, uh, of the Israelite sons of Jacob. He's talking spiritually of those who are in Christ, the true Israel. The ones that he said back in Isaiah, he's going to draw from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. He's going to draw all these people together. And in the New Testament, it shows that that remnant, the remnant that's going to be saved, the remnant of Israel, are those who give their life to the Lord through Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm going to give them rest. He says, I have loved them with an everlasting love. I've drawn them with an unfailing kindness. I will. Build you up again. Boy, I'd like God to build my life. How about you? You want God to build your life? You ever do a construction project? You hire a con contractor? <laughs> you ever the contractor, Leon? <laughs> Why do people hire you? Not, not just because the price is right, <laughs> but because they have confidence that you will do what needs to be done, right? And there are times in which we have all made our choice of one thing over another, even though the price maybe was more expensive. And what was it that would cause us to spend more money on this? Well, I guess it's not the same thing, is it? Because you're paying for something better. And we do that on purpose because we recognize the benefits of what's better. Do you want God to build your life? Because he can build it better. And that's what Jesus came when he was talking to his disciples. He says, follow me because I can build your life better. <laughs> Imitate me. Go where I go. Say what I say. Do what I do because that will be better for you. Let me build your life. And the wise man builds his house on a good foundation, right? He says there in in uh, Jeremiah, he says, See, I'm going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind, the lame, the expectant mothers, and the women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them into the streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is the firstborn. And then he goes on to say a little bit later, he says, they will come and shout for joy. They will rejoice. They'll be like a well-watered garden. They will, suffer, they will sorrow no more. He says, I'll give them comfort. I will satisfy. I will give them joy. They will be filled. They'll return from the land of the enemy. But they must return on the way that God provides. You know, it's interesting. He goes on to say, he says, so here's what I want you to do, guys. <laughs> 
to the leadership of Israel. He says, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to do these things, okay? The time's going to come where Messiah is going to bring the people back to God that have been uh, dispersed throughout, and God's going to bring them back to him. He says, here's what I want you people to do. He says, set up road signs. Put up guideposts. Take note of the highway, the road you take. Return. How long will you wander? The Lord will create a new thing on earth. A new thing. Goes on to say, the days are coming, declare the Lord, in verse 31, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It's not going to be like the old one. It's going to be new. This covenant I will make with the people at that time. I'm going to put their laws in their minds, write it on their hearts. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. No longer will they teach a neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will know me from the least of them to the greatest. My friends, when we think about Jesus being the Father, <coughs> Jesus is the way to the Father. But our lives are the way to Jesus. And he has given us his word by which we can use to lead others to the way. So they won't be like Thomas that says, we don't know the way to the Father. Because that's what people say to us in the world. We don't know the way to heaven. We need to know the way. Will somebody show us the way? Remember, Philip was on given a command by the Spirit and said, there's somebody on the road I want you to go meet. So Philip, you know, hiked up his skirt and took off. Because they kind of wore long, glossy clothes. Anyway, so he takes off running. He catches up to this chariot. And there's this guy reading from the same scroll Jesus read from when he was in Nazareth. Behold, I send you forth like a sheep to the slaughter. And so Philip asked him, do you understand the path to heaven? Now, he, kind of like that. He says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I unless someone explain it to me? And he began right there, the scripture says, and told, told him about Jesus. Are we any different? See, we need to meet people where they are. As they're going through the empty places, the wilderness. And we need to, need to meet them on the path where they're at, at that point. And we need to be the place in which we reveal the way to the Father, Jesus Christ. We need to be a road sign, a guidepost set up in this world. you ever think about yourself that way? You're a detour. <laughs> I'm God's detour. When people come to me in life, I'm going to get them from this track to this track and head them towards the Father through Jesus Christ. How many people have passed us? Oh, there will be people who run the stop sign. They do that a lot. But that's not, their, you know, it's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to be that son and be faithful to redirect, to tell them the way to the Father. That's our job. Meet people where they are, in the path that led them to that place, and then show them the way from there to the Father. Because Jesus said, I am the way. He said, I am the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We're going to talk about what that means as far as the truth and the life. You know, I had one fellow set up tell me not too long ago, we were chatting um, over in the shores, uh, Roman, Roman Rock Shores, and I was doing a job for them, and we had a little discussion. And uh, I mentioned this guy before to you, and uh, he says, well, I don't believe and he calls himself a leader in a Protestant church. He says, I don't believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. He says, I guess that doesn't make me a very good Christian. Now, I'm not the judge of anyone, but if someone doesn't believe that the scripture, the words of Jesus himself, <laughs> that I am the way, and no one no one, without exception, no one comes to the Father except through me. It gives a lot more impetus to when Jesus said, I'm the gate. Remember we talked about that? 
on the way in. So we started there, and I taught him about Jesus. I want you to look this next week at yourself differently. I want you to look at yourself as that diversion from destruction to life for others. You have a grand opportunity, and God's going to put somebody in your path. Maybe a little opportunity, get you started. God's going to give you opportunities here in the future to... to uh, to work with this and to grow in this. Now, maybe you may not be successful the very first time. But if this church is to grow, every one of us, every one of us needs to be in the link, that link in the chain that shares Jesus Christ. Gracious Heavenly Father, put that challenge upon each one of our hearts to be that link in the chain, to be that sign on the road that shows people Jesus Christ, to let them know they need to be in Christ in order to get to heaven. they got to go through Him no other way. So Father, help us to know that, to be assured of that, and then to seek out Your Word so that we can teach others as well. Help us in this endeavor, Lord, we pray. For it is a holy, a way of holiness. Thank You, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as there is one way to God, and it's important that we keep that way clear for people. There's, there's also an importance that your heart is prepared to receive the Lord. There are times where we put our own roadblocks in our lives. And we say, Lord, you're allowed in, but only so far. Lord, I'm going to be obedient, but only up to a point. Because I know a better way. I know a different way. Or I think I do. So it's important that, that we allow our hearts to be prepared. That all the hills of resistance are brought low. All of the valleys that slow us down or try to get in our way are leveled and brought up so that the way is made clear for the Lord to do His work in our life. That's called humility. And it's about turning away from self and turning to the Lord. And the Scripture talks about not just... You know, and this is, this is the thing we have to be careful of. It's not... No one else can do something for you in which you'll be saved. And there's some of you here that know that that there are those who teach that if you pay enough money, you can save your ancestors. <laughs> if you pay money to the church, you can save people that have already died. That's absurd, because then the way to heaven is through money, not through Jesus. And there are those who believe that they can save their children. A parent cannot save the children, only Christ can. And we must give our life to the Lord individually, and that comes when we are responsible for our lives, not as a child. And Jesus saves us through the washing of regeneration through his blood. That blood that's taken into the holy place before the Father. You see. Where are you at in that process? Because it's not just saying, you know, I believe that what you said is true. <laughs> it's about saying, I believe what you said is true to the point in which I will follow it every letter. There's a difference between the two. Have you decided to follow Jesus? 376. Would you stand with me? 376.